Now in chapter 42, we go back to Canaan and we see what's happening at home, what's happening in the family of Jacob, what's happening among Joseph's brothers. And the thing that's happening is they're getting hungry. They're getting hungry. And so Jacob says, you know, I've heard that they've got plenty of food in Egypt. So if we're gonna, if we're gonna keep from starving, you gotta go to Egypt and buy some food. Verse four, uh, chapter 42, why are you staring at one another? I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us from that place so that we may live and not die. Who has salvation? Joseph. But they don't know it. Then ten brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, I'm afraid that harm may befall him. You see, Benjamin is the son of Rachel. And Benjamin is the son who was born when Jacob was older. Jacob did have two sons of Rachel, the wife whom he loved. Now he only has one, he thinks, and that is Benjamin. So he doesn't want Benjamin going off to a far country. My youngest child flew to Brazil this week. I'm very concerned about her because it's a dangerous country. Jacob is concerned about Benjamin, so he won't let him go on a dangerous journey. You can imagine with all the famine, everybody's poor, nobody has anything, that they're robbers along those roads trying to take food, trying to take money. So the ten brothers travel. I'm sure they're heavily armed. They probably took servants with them. But Jacob wants Benjamin to stay at home and to stay safe. I'm afraid, he says in verse 4. So they came to buy grain. Now look at this, verse 6, chapter 42, verse 6. Joseph was the ruler over all the land. He was the one who sold to, to the people of the land. And Joseph, look at, verse, look at verse 6, Genesis 42, verse 6. Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. What is that? Tell me what that is. Tell me. The fulfillment of the dream. It's the fulfillment of the dream. The dream was true. It took 13 years, but the dream was true. Now, when I was your age, a long time ago, I had a great hero. His name was Bob Dylan. When I went to university, I did not have one picture of Bob Dylan in my room. I had two. Two big posters of Bob Dylan. And Bob Dylan made a song in 1966 called Just Like a Woman. And in that song, Just Like a Woman, here's what Bob Dylan said. He said, When we meet again, introduced as friends, please don't let on that you knew me when. I was hungry, and it was your world. Now, don't worry if you don't really know what that means because I'm not even sure that Bob Dylan knew what it meant. Nobody really knew what he meant when he was singing. That's one reason we were so interested in him. But it's interesting to me that he describes a situation like this. They meet again. They are hungry. But it's Joseph's world. They don't know who Joseph is, but he knows who they are. And they're bowing down before him. 
and the original dream, the dream of the sheaves of grain in the field, the dream of the sun and the moon and the stars is fulfilled in chapter 42, 13 years after he had the dream. So they bow down to him. Verse 7 says, When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but they didn't recognize him. He disguised himself and he spoke harshly to them. And of course, he was speaking in an Egyptian language. He wasn't speaking the language of Canaan. Not only did he recognize them and they could not recognize him, but he also could understand their language when they were speaking to each other, but they didn't know he could understand it. He said, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. Verse 8, Joseph recognized his brothers. They did not recognize him. Joseph remembered the dreams which he had about them. And he said to them, you are spies. You are come to look at the undefended parts of the land. Now, I told you that there are people who teach the story of Joseph and they say, Joseph did something wrong. Joseph should have never told his family about the dreams. That was arrogant, that was proud, that was boastful. And I said, no, 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 no. Joseph did the right thing. But here's another place where many, many Bible teachers say, Joseph was wrong to play these tricks on his brothers. He lied to them. He was wrong. I say, no, 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 no. He was right. The way Joseph responded to his brothers, uh, he deceived them. That's the charge. What he did was sinful. What he did was wrong. Uh, I want to maintain and I want to defend the thesis that what he did was not wrong. What he did was very appropriate. Let me tell you the reason why. There are certain arenas that when we step into those arenas, what would normally be a sin because of deception is not a sin. Let me say that sport and athletics is one of those arenas. Let's say a soccer player is coming down the field very quickly. He's kicking the ball. He pretends that he's going to go at the goal. He's going to go at the net from the right side. But at the last minute, he switches to the left side and he kicks the ball into the net from the left side. Is that soccer player immoral? Did he sin? Will he deceive the goalie? He was trying to deceive the goalie. Did he sin? I don't think he did sin. I think when you're in that arena that that's what you're supposed to do. Now, another arena like that is war. In June of 1944, the Allies on the Western Front, of course, your soldiers were fighting on the Eastern Front, but the Allies on the Western Front were preparing to invade the continent of Europe. They very much wanted Hitler to believe that they were going to cross the channel and land at Calais. Really, they weren't going to land at Calais. They were going to land at Normandy. June 6, 1944. Now, was Eisenhower, were Eisenhower and Churchill sinners and liars because they tried to make Hitler believe they were going to land at Calais because they were going to land, even though they were going to land at Normandy? Was that a sin? Was that wrong? Were they immoral because of that? They may have been immoral for other reasons. They may have been sinners for other reasons. But they weren't sinners and immoral because of that. Why? Because they were at war. Now let me tell you something. Joseph's brothers were at war with him. Joseph's brothers were at war with him. And how does he know they've changed? 
How does he know that Benjamin is really alive? They told his father a lie about him. How does he know they're not telling him a lie about Benjamin? How does he know that his father is still alive? He certainly can't know because they say it. Now, the brothers are still lying to Joseph. How do I know that? You know, um, there is humor in the Bible. Did you know that? There are things in the Bible that make us laugh. We don't realize it because when we read the Bible, we're not prepared for humor. And when we read the Bible, we don't see the humor. But there's a lot of humor in the Bible. And one of the funniest things in the Bible is in this chapter we're studying. We're studying Genesis 42. In Genesis 42, the brothers of Joseph are explaining to Joseph the situation back at home. Look at what they say in verse 11. They say to Joseph, we are honest men. That's hilarious. They are honest men? That's really a good one. They're still lying. They're lying about who they are. When Joseph says to them, you are spies, you have come to spy out undefended parts of the land, how does Joseph know that that's not true? According to their character, that could very well be true because these boys never tell the truth. They never tell the truth. Now, they are at war with Joseph because of what they've done to him. They tried to kill him. They tried to keep him out. Joseph knows he's at war with them, but Joseph's goal in the war is a good goal. Joseph is really on their side even though they're at war with him because you know what Joseph is doing? Joseph is trying to keep them alive. Joseph is trying to bring them back. Joseph is trying to keep their family together. Joseph is trying to redeem them. And Joseph does redeem them. He not only redeems them physically, he redeems them spiritually. And what he does is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And um, what he did was of the Lord. The plan that he put into effect did not come from Joseph, it came from God. And what he did was right. By the way, um, in my opinion, the story of Joseph and his brothers is the greatest story in the history of the world. It's as great as any story in literature. And in contrast to literature, this story really happened. It's a report of true history. Thomas Mann, the great German novelist who won the Nobel Prize in 1950, he also believed it was the greatest story in, in history and he actually wrote uh, a series of, of books about this story called uh, Josef und seine Bruder, Joseph and His Brothers. And it's an amazing, amazing story. Joseph says to them in verse 9, chapter 42, verse 9, You are spies. You have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. They said to him, No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. That's a lie. That is a lie. They are not honest men. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Yet he said to them, No, but you have come to look at the undefended parts of the land. But they said, Your servants are twelve brothers in all. 
the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. See, they were also lying about whether he was alive or not. They didn't know that he was dead. When they sold him to the Midianites, he was alive. So they're lying. They're lying to him. Joseph said to them, It is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you will be tested. By the life of Pharaoh you shall not go from this place until your youngest brother comes here. Now, the first thing that he says is that everyone is staying here except for one person. One person will go back and bring Benjamin back. That's the first thing he told them. The second thing that he told them was that everybody would go back except for one person. Why did he do that? Well, it could be that he just really wanted to scare them and think that all of them were going to stay there except for one person. Or it could be that he changed his mind. It could be that it was his original plan to keep all of them but one, but then he realized how dangerous it would be. Let's say you have a group of robbers or a group of murderers. They would certainly attack one man, but they may not attack, ten, they may not attack nine men. So probably Joseph thought, no, it'll be too dangerous, so I will just keep one person. So he keeps his brother Simeon, who is the second born. Simeon is one of the brothers who killed the Shechemites in Genesis 34. Um, first he says in verse 16, Sin one while you all remain here. And then he put them in prison for three days, verse 17. Now on the third day, verse 18, Joseph said to them, do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in your prison. But as for the rest of you, go, carry grain for the famine of your households. Bring your youngest brother to me, so your words may be verified and you will not die. And they said to one another, Truly we are guilty. Now they're speaking their own language. They don't think he can understand it. Truly we are guilty concerning our brother, because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress, this distress has come upon us. Okay, verse 22, Reuben says this to them. Did I not tell you, do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Now the next thing that Reuben says, I don't know how it sounds in Russian, but in English, it's very powerful. As a matter of fact, it's one of the most powerful verses in the Old Testament. What Reuben says is, now comes the reckoning for his blood. In other words, we shed his blood. As far as he's concerned, they killed him. They really didn't kill him. But he could have been killed later. They don't know what's happened to him. And what Reuben is saying is, now we're being judged for the blood of our brother. Now comes the judgment. Now comes the payback because of what we did to Joseph. You know, the whole world one day is going to say about Jesus, now comes the reckoning for his blood. Now the whole world will have to account for the blood of Jesus. Joseph's life, Joseph's experience is a picture and a pattern of the career of the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes them 13 years to understand that they've done the wrong thing. And it's not because of their conscience. It's not because they have a tender conscience. It's because of the consequences. They realize that what they have reaped, what they have sown, they have reaped. They realize that there was a connection between the sin against their brother and what's happening to them in Egypt. They know the two things are connected. They sent him as a prisoner to Egypt. Now they are prisoners in Egypt. 
and they realize that God is doing something. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Verse 23 says they didn't understand that Joseph could understand what they were saying because there was an interpreter between them and Joseph. They were listening to Joseph speak in one of the Egyptian dialects through an interpreter. They didn't know that Joseph did not need an interpreter. He was listening to them talk back to them. But at that moment when, they, when he heard that they realized that what they did to him was wrong and they were being punished for it, it says in verse 24 that he turned away from them and he wept. He came back to them. He took Simeon, the second oldest, and he tied him up. Then he told his servants, verse 25, Then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to restore every man's money in his sack to give them provisions for the journey. And thus was done, it was done for them. So what happened is they were given bags of grain which they paid for. What they didn't know was that their money was put back in the bags. Why did Joseph do that? I'll tell you one reason he did it. Redemption is free. Salvation is free. You can't pay for it. You can only receive it as a gift. So it says in verse 26, they loaded their donkeys with their grain and they left. And when one of them opened the sack to feed his donkey at the place where they stopped, he saw his money. It was in the sack. Then he said to his brothers, my money's here. It's in my sack. It says their hearts sank. They, returned, they, they turned trembling to one another and they said, What is this that God has done to us? They don't say, What is this that this ruler in Egypt has done to us? They say, What is it that God has done to us? They're starting to understand that God is in control. God is in control of their lives. They're not free agents. They're not off determining their own destinies. They're not off... Uh, planning what's going to happen and making it happen because it's their will and they want it to happen. No, 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 no. It's happening because of what God wants to happen. God is in control of their lives. They thought they were in control, but they're not. And now they begin to realize it. Verse 29 says that when they got back home to see their father in the land of Canaan, they told him everything that had happened. They say in verse 30, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke harshly with us and took us for spies in the country. But we said to him, We are honest men. See, they're even proud of the lie that they told. We are honest men. We are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no longer alive. The younger is with our father today in the land of Canaan. The man, the Lord of that land, said to us, By this will I know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your households and go. But bring your youngest brother to me that I may know that you are not spies, but honest men. I will give your brother to you that you may trade in the land. Then they said, we discovered we still had our money. Verse 36, Jacob said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, You may put my two sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. 
Put him in my care and I will return him to you. Jacob said, My son will not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he alone is left. In other words, I only had two sons from Rachel and one of them is dead. I'm not giving up the other son of Rachel. If harm should befall him on his journey you are taking, on the journey you are taking, then you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. What he means by that is he says, I will grieve until the day I die. My life will be over, so you're not taking it. But they get hungry. After a while, they eat all the food. And now they're hungry. What are they going to do? Maybe Benjamin will die on the way to Egypt. Maybe Benjamin will die in Egypt. Maybe Benjamin will die on the way back. But for sure Benjamin's going to die if he doesn't have anything to eat. If they don't take the risk, Benjamin's going to die at home because everybody's going to die at home because they're going to starve to death. 